Yeah, well, thank you very much for that kind invite, and uh, and it's great to be here uh, amongst friends and um, and yeah, we're all we're all part of the same culture of making, which which. Um, I want to kind of explore a bit more about how materials, and that's obviously my specialty, how I feel that materials um, is, is so important to that and, and how it creates the kind of conditions by which making happens. But also, I'm going to kind of provoke you a little bit because I thought that was my job at the beginning. I'm a scientist, and it feels to me like there's, there is... What, Whatever we say about this kind of coming together for innovation, I totally agree with that. And that's what Institute Making is all about. There's also a tension. And I think it's that creative tension, the kind of slight distrust of a scientist by, let's say, an arts person, and vice versa, <laughs> that I want to explore a little bit. And, and work, working on how, how it can be useful and perhaps, put, and, and perhaps be an obstacle. So, first of all, materials. Um, Let's not forget that everything is made of something. And um, for me, all of these materials waiting for the bus uh, are worth noting. <laughs> you know, people go on and on about the, the rainforest, how wonderful it is. But for me, the, you know, the city centre and urban landscape is just as complex, it's just as wonderful. And the thing is that we created this, right? I mean, this is, this is who we are. This is a reflection of us. You know, if it wasn't for these materials, we would be standing in a muddy field now, shivering naked. And we wouldn't want that. <laughs> and, and, and historically, we haven't wanted that, right? So hence all this stuff, hence the stuff we're wearing, and all our technology. And these are the materials, you know, the ages of civilization are named after them. And, and of course, you know, of course they're innovation. Each one of these is a technology. Uh, each one of these has pushed human consciousness into a new arena, a, an alternative possibility. And the one that we're currently living in is a kind of amalgam of all that, right? So, um, so I want to kind of talk about essentially where 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 do these materials come from in us, in our in that kind of like that desire, the human desire to make them, um, and also what possibilities they open up. And in particular, I want to talk about a bit later about this this idea of up here we've so living materials and animate matter, and where where it where it fits or doesn't fit in craft. And to start myself off on this, <laughs> I thought I would, um, I would, thought I would just show you a little film. This is um, a challenge that I sort of said yes to earlier in the year. BBC challenged me to cook better than another maker. And this one was Marcus, um, welcome to a cooking competition. Well, yeah. Okay, now, <laughs> obviously, uh, sorry, it was a foolish thing to do to, um, to challenge uh, uh, an expert maker uh, at the height of his game into making a different material, the edible materials, right? But, but you know, 
who was I kidding? I was never going to win. What's good about that, in a way, is that it highlights this kind of opposition, right? And that the BBC wanted that. They wanted this kind of very op oppositional competition between us. And it was kind of sort of, you know, going into that whole kind of, well, you've got science. Science does it this way, and makers and craftspeople do it that way. And they have different opposing views and different outcomes. And, and, and I just want you to bring you back to a statement which you, you might have missed by Marcus. But anyway... In the end, he says, look, at the end of the day, it's a lot of love, care, and understanding. And he says it, he says it like science isn't that. Like science isn't any of that stuff, okay? And I, this sort of rat rattled around my head for a week in the kitchen with Marcus. Just imagine that for the moment. Um, and um, and I wanna, I'm going to keep coming back to this because I had to spend a lot of time trying to resolve this in my own head. And I'm going to kind of work it through with you now. It's like a sort of therapy. So, okay. So where, where is that? Where is that care, understanding, and love in this picture, in these materials? Is it in the aluminium alloys? Is it in the paint? Is it in the glass? Where is it? And I've got to kind of, in a sense, sort of lay out where I am with science and my approach first and ask you to kind of come into that world in order for us to explore the, you know, the origin of, of, of where any of that stuff might be. And, and essentially, this is all you really need to know about the science of materials. Um, and forgive anyone in the audience who is already a material scientist or you've seen this before. I'm just going to go through this, which is that essentially the science of materials is the, the great insight, which is essentially a sort of 20th century insight, is that the properties of materials, the hardness, the strength, the color, the transparency, that all comes from the structure at different microstructural levels inside the material itself. So scale is really important, as so you have big things at the top, small, 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 small. And so here we have, on the left-hand side, or your right-hand side, we have the living matter, right? Living materials. And on the, on, on, on the right, we have... Um, man-made materials, so, but they have the same structural kind of conceit. So we, we're familiar with trees and whales and mice and then the fleas on the mice, but then as you go further down, you find they have hairs on them and those do particular things. They sense things, they keep them warm. And if you zoom into the hairs, you find they're made of many cells and those are called tissues. And your skin is a tissue, your brain is a tissue, your liver is a tissue. And if you zoom in again, you get to the cells, the individual cells, and so nature makes everything out of cells, which is a remarkable feat, which we won't get into at the moment. And if you think, well, how do the cells do it? Right? How do they reproduce themselves? Um, how do they kind of change? How, do, how does a single cell, because you started from a single cell, so did I, and so did the tree, and so did the whale, how does a single cell turn itself into something as hard as a, as a tooth, or as soft as your skin, or as prickly as a piece of hair? But it's the same cell. How does it do it? answer we don't know, but that's a really interesting area of scientific exploration, and it involves going even further into the cell, macromolecules, and then finally you get right to the center of the cell, and you find that there's something called DNA there, and DNA is the code, right, the code, the genes in your, in you, in your cells are the code for the molecules. The molecules then make, allow the cells to do this magic, which we're not sure how they do, and that creates tissues and so on up. So, now, okay, so that's, that's the scale uh, that we're familiar with. I mean, it's a vocabulary you all know, really. And of course, in the materials world, you know, the sort of the cement of this, the concrete, you know, your clothes, they have all those scales in it too. And we've just got good and better and better and better over the thousands of years at manipulating those scales. At first, we didn't have specific names for these scales. Crystal scale down here, the nano scale, the atomic scale. The Greeks knew, thought they knew about atoms. They had this theory. They couldn't really nail it. It takes until the 17th, 18th century until chemistry comes along and starts to really understand what types of atom you have down here, what to play with. A hundred types of atom, it turns out. And it's been the 20th century where we've started to understand what blacksmiths were doing all those years ago, understanding how if you hit a piece of metal that you change its properties. And how do you do it? Well, you're changing the crystals, the way the metal crystals inside relate to each other. And if you change them, then you change the strength, or you, you reduce the carbon content. And, and they knew it with their hands, they knew it phenomenologically, they didn't have a descriptive method for, for understanding how to do it systematically. And of course, the 20th century 
comes along with all our microscopes and analytical tools and chemistry and so on, physics, and basically lays this all out. Okay, so it's all laid out now. And in a way, 20th century has bequeathed us this incredible knowledge. And the, and the objects that are kind of epitomize this are things like the mobile phone, the, you know, the, the smartphone, which has you know, you know, little tiny machines in it, has ultimate control of crystals, single crystals, the silicon single crystal, the, the transistors, you've got a billion of them in your phone. They're smaller than a hair on your arm. <laughs> Right, but they're all connected, and they make your phone do amazing things. You've got the touch screen on the front, indium tin oxide, transparent conductor. You can't see it, but it knows you've touched the object. People worship the phone. They, they consult it about every 90 seconds, it turns out. This is the object in most people's lives that is the one that's most worshipped. OK, so there's definitely understanding there, right? <laughs> and, but maybe there's not care, and maybe there's not love. Okay, in this schematic, right? Where is that? The stuff that Marcus was talking about. Um, so let's have a look. <laughs> um, so let me just take a few modern technologies that are kind of growing, unlike the, the, the mobile phone market, which is very mature. So carbon technology is a material that essentially mature scientists can claim to have invented. Um, it's, it, 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 it sort of comes left field as a result of you know, wanting to fly, essentially. The, the desire to fly turned out to be about trying to create light, stiff, strong materials. Carbon fiber was invented. It didn't quite work in the early 50s when they wanted to make it work, so they went to aluminum. And then as we've, as we've dialed forward, we've started to make our planes out of carbon fiber composites. Now, implicitly, there is care in that construction of that material. Because that, the only reason that's driving that is the efficiency of the fuel. It, it's trying to go further for less fuel. It's, it, 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 you, might, you might say, well, actually, that's an economic desire. That's not care. That's, that's a kind of reduction of fuel costs. And, and, and you can't really execrate the two. But essentially, the fact that we all want to go on holiday or we all want to go and visit our cousin in America is made possible by carbon fiber. And so there is, there is actually, if you look at the whole system all the way down to the carbon molecules down here, all the way up through all these different structures, the woven fiber, the epoxy, the, the, the prototypes along the way, these carbon fiber bikes that everyone's so keen on, the Tesla motor car. See, the Tesla motor car is, in a sense, probably a view of the future of cars, because it's carbon is probably going to take over steel as the main body of most cars, it, because we need to go away from um, oil and petrol as a fuel for cars because of global warming. And we're going to probably have to go to electric cars. That's the most likely thing. Tesla is a prototype of that and actually a commercial prototype. So it's got a carbon body. It's carbon fiber. So, so, so there is a bit of love, right? A love, <laughs> sort of, right? Love for the world. Perhaps, you might argue. I'm arguing. <laughs> um, but there's a lot of clunkiness there, too. This is not a recyclable material at all. Um, so, so that's not careful, is it? We're creating a whole new technology. We're creating thousands of aeroplanes, probably millions of cars, in which we have no care for what happens at the end of their life. That's not care. Um, OK, let's, let's, go, let's go to another example, solar cells. Another, another kind of wonder material that's come out of the material science age. Um, you know, we, 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 kind of, we, we kind of discovered silicon as this great material. Here it is, polycrystalline down here at these tiny scales. And actually, down here at the kind of a, atomic scale, what's happening is a photon of light comes down here, hits a crystal, and, is, and it excites an electron and allows it to, to get into a conduction band. And that band can then use it to recharge a battery. And that allows us to store that light as electric energy. And therefore, you have this amazing opportunity to wean ourselves off fossil fuels by just harvesting light from the sun. This is as close as we've got to the magic of the leaf of a tree. But actually, you know, Marcus might be a bit, a bit more on the money here about the lack of care, because although implicitly this is about environmentalism, right, the actual result is fields and fields of, you know, industrial-looking arrays of these things. There's little care there. There's little involvement in the human side of the materials development. They get stuck on roofs in a way to say, oh, they're kind of this add-on, but they're not integral to your life. And I think that's where the craft and maker community 
have enormous skill, right? But they seem to be completely excluded from the development of this material. Feels like you guys are not embedded in here because, or you're being rejected from being in here because look at the results, right? This, this feels to me like um, a material which, which could be accused of being a sort of surrogate for industrialization or taking over fields, taking over roofs, but without any human kind of element to it. Um, and then batteries is another example where, of course, they're sort of intrinsic to our modern life. The electric car, the mobile phone, the, the lithium battery inside your phone, the thing you curse for running out of power, for not being good enough. That's all the details. That's the, that's the deep understanding down here, which we've got really good at, these tiny microscopic scale stuff. But what we've got bad at is dealing with where they actually end up in our objects, what happens to them at end of life, they don't really get recycled. They just sort of get discarded. Um, you know, the whole battery industry is, a, is an odd one, actually, because these are very extraordinary minerals, copper, zinc, lithium. Like, we spend a lot of time and effort and energy getting out of the ground. And actually, <laughs> you know, you know we, we, we spend more time obsessing about plastic bags, uh, recycling plastic bags, than we do about this stuff. Uh, it's very odd, that. Um, and it's something that we kind of should do something about. So. That's the kind of, so I think Marcus in a way has a, has a point when he's sort of pointing the finger at me, which is that, you know, we've run ahead of ourselves, we've been clever, we've, uh, we've understood this kind of trick, and we've created this technology, but we've done it without bringing the very people, and I would argue it's your community, with us to make those technologies human and, and, and actually be part of our lives and holistically um, important. Um, and then, then if we just look one stage further ahead, so, so at the moment, I'm, I've been talking about these two sides of the world. So there's the, the living matter and the non-living matter. But you can see, when you look at this diagram, that unless you believe that living matter has some magic element, unless you believe that when we actually finally get to the grips with the chemistry and physics down here, we find that actually we can't understand it, like we need an extra thing to understand living organisms. But no one really believes that's going to be true. Most people think, that this is ablaze the laws of physics and the same ones that we have on this side, which means that living matter invented by us, so a mobile phone that gets better when you drop it on the floor, if you just put it to bed and give it a little lem sip, <laughs> is possible, is totally possible. And will we invent them? Well, almost certainly. We've already got self-healing concrete. Um, so we got, this is, a, and I won't go into the details, I'm running out of time, but you know, we've got concrete that heals itself, it cracks, and it will heal itself to 90% of the strength. I'm working on a project with a whole load of people on self-healing roads. And so the idea, it sounds ludicrous that the roads, the potholes, would heal themselves overnight. But not only is it possible, but actually we've already found evidence that the roads already heal themselves. The microscopic cracks do already heal themselves. And that there's an enormous amount of detail which we're working on down here, which means that we have real reason to hope that roads will not need intervention in the future. And so then you're like, OK, this seems like a kind of strange way forward. So this is a big, when I mean, you look at the kind of anatomy of this project, it's these enormous industrial partners. It's, you know, it's, it's a kind of, it's a national wide thing. It's got loads of industrial partners. This feels something that's, that's kind of been driven by, by economics. And, and you'd be right. You talk to these people and they know there's enormous amounts of money for a pair of the roads and it's a never ending task. And it's getting less economically feasible as we have more infrastructure. We want the infrastructure to have our lives that we live, the airports, the roads, the bridges, the tunnels, the trains. We want all of that stuff, but we actually can't afford to have the people repair it. And also, those jobs are not necessarily the jobs that people want to do. And so you look at something like that, and you think, OK, if we had a self-repairing road, right, and you, this was no longer a thing of the past, is this a good thing or a bad thing? Where's the care? Where's the care in a material? Where's the love <laughs> in a material that's so sophisticated it doesn't even need humans to build itself and rebuild itself? So does this, make, does this make the kind of human element, the craft element, does that make it redundant if we start going down an animate materials road? OK, so we're back to this again in a way. Like, in what sense does this act on us, this love, right? The care, we care, it's important, right? This is an important statement, but 
But to who is it important? Not to the road. Not to the road. <laughs> and actually not to you. If, you, if, no one build, no, if no one repairs those roads, and those roads are great, and you drive them, you don't have to worry about them, you, you're happy, right? So, so then what is it then? What, what, what am I trying to get at? What am I trying to pick at this scab, this, this, this thing? And I, and I, think, I think I've come to, to, to kind of realize it is that it's in repairing things or in making things, you act on yourself. It's us who receive the love, not the materials. Materials couldn't care less about the love. <laughs> the, the act of making things and the, and the community of makers is about us. It's about growing our humanity and our, ourselves. And so what you need is not so much less detail, less technical stuff, because that's not relevant to this point. The point is, who is involved in making things? And, and how does it act on us? And that's why, I mean, it's, it's, it's the very point that we, we all were making along the line, which is that that's why materials research cannot exclude anyone. In fact, I think that actually farmers and gardeners, I think a lot of people who do infrastructure in the future will be more like gardeners. I'm absolutely sure that self-healing infrastructure is coming. 2050, it will be here in big way. And the people who mend the road, so-called, or look after it, will be more like gardeners. They'll be pruning bits of road that have gone wild, you know? <laughs> there'll be a new road that overnight has opened up a hole, and they'll be like, no, 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 no. <laughs> you know, but it, but it won't be people digging up the road anymore. And I don't think that means that craft is threatened. I don't mean that the people who make roads and that love of a lovely, clean piece of tarmac, which we all really enjoy, I don't think that goes at all. It's, it, it's just that we have to make sure that as we get a more complex world, that we don't leave people behind. And that's, I think, the, the big thing. And that's obviously what we've been trying to do at the Institute of Making, which is do exactly this, is have a place where, where people of all, who, who all need to be involved, makers, designers, Psychologists, medics, humanities, scientists, architects, users, the, and in fact, the people who are going to use it, right? Um, the people who are going to be involved, those people who currently dig up the roads, they should be involved in this research. And, and, and that's, that's, that's why I think that's where the love comes from. So actually, I go back to Marcus and his statement. Where, where is his statement? I'm, I'm singling him out. But I go back to Marcus and say, actually, you know, my knowledge of chef's kitchens is not that there's much love actually in it. The truth is that it, they are very hard play. Talk to any chef. It's a hard, hard, hard world. If their job of cutting carrots in the morning would be replaced by robots, that would be totally fine by them. And basically, washing up has been replaced by robots, and nobody is complaining. It's not that the love gets into the food, right? You cannot tell love in food, but who you can tell is the people who are making the food. They get the love. So I, I don't think it's the customer. It's, it's this conceit, I think, in the chef industry that the best food, the most expensive food, has the most love in it. And I don't believe that for a minute. It's the kitchens where people feel they have a proper job, it's properly paid, and it has proper kind of love in it. That's important. And I think the maker jobs that you can make a living out of and have love in them are things where we should be going. And that is back to the efficiency. We have to contribute to the overall economy to get that. And that's, that's the trick. That's the hard bit. And actually, chef's kitchens are not a good example of this. <laughs> um, OK, so that's really all I wanted to say, I think. Um, I hope I've stimulated you. It is a lot about love. And I obviously have to love and care and understand and say thank you to all these people who do the work with me at the Institute of Making. And thanks for listening.